Welcome all. Today I am going to start talking about the Linux file system. I want to explain it and I want to show you its architecture. Now, if you have worked before with Windows, you might have noticed you might have noticed that you have a C partition always and then on a C partition you have all the system files and you can't actually go to the root of the system rather instead you can go to the partitions of the system and on C drive that is considered to be the root of the system. Such is not the case in Linux. In Linux you have a root of the file system where everything is contained regardless of the di regardless of the disk partitions and disk and disks themselves. So you can have multiple disks with multiple partitions but they will all be in the main root of the file system. Well, not directly there, but from there you will be able to navigate to it. If you go ahead and type in, if you go ahead and type in cd slash, you're gonna be taken to the root of the file system. And then from there, type in ls and you will see these directories. This is the tree, this is the file structure here that is the key to pretty much everything else. Let's go one by one over these folders. They are quite important and you should know what is contained in each one of them. Well, you don't have to know exactly what is contained in each one of them, but you do need to have a general idea what sort of uh, what sort of things are stored in each one of these folders. If we go ahead and start from bin, in bin system binaries are stored and by that I mean programs, basically programs that are used by the system are stored in bin, so system programs. Not to say that you can't use them either. Under dev, you, we have devices. So let's just go ahead and quickly see what is in bin and what is in devices. By the way, device dev is actually a, vir a virtual directory. There, a listing of uh, uh, our hardware, when it is loaded, it is listed there. I'm going to show you in a moment what I mean by it. So in bin, you see we have these commands here. I'm not sure if we actually have... Okay, so mcopy is there. There we go. We have yum, which we use to install packets. Not sure if we have anything familiar here. We have actually... There we go. We have ls. So you see these are the programs that are... These are the sort of programs that are stored here. If we go ahead and type in, oh, let's, oh no, sorry, go back and then let's go into dev. And if we do ls here, you will see that this this is actually our hardware. I'm sure that you can recognize some of the devices from the list without much thinking. But if I go up, this one probably won't be an obvious one. This is actually my CD-ROM drive. This is where I would insert a CD, basically, in a physical sense, in the physical world. If I go ahead and exit, I'm going to just go ahead and actually go back, clear the screen, and do, oops, not to LL, I'm just going to do LS here. Excellent. So now we have the home directory. The home directory is a place where all the home, uh, where all the users have their own home directories where they store their own files and so on. Right next to it you have lib64 and if you take a look down below there is actually lib. So you have lib64 for 64-bit systems. Here you would generally store libraries. Uh, libraries that are to be used that are linked and they would be stored either in this folder lib64 or just lib. Keep in mind that they can also be stored here in within this folder there's like usr slash local slash library something of a kind don't hold my word for it i will show you in a moment uh, there you can also find local and shared libraries but we're, we're going to get to that in a moment from here we have mnt what is a full what is a directory mnt well mnt is a mount point for devices so if you mount a disk or something of a kind, it doesn't need to, it, I mean, I'm not generally talking about a USB, a disk that you would plug in with a USB or something of a kind. In the MNT folder, that's the temporary mounting place for drives in general, and devices and drives in general. You would be able to mount a drive 
I don't know, God knows where in the world and basically be able to access it from Linux. No problems. Actually, it's quite easy. There isn't that much to it. It's actually just one single line where you use the mount command and then you specify the file system type. So it can be in a Windows NTFS. In uh, Linux, it's, there is a wide variety of them, usually XTF4, but we have used XFS here. You would need to specify that and then you would mount it and if we go into MNT it should be empty. I'm not sure, I don't think I have mounted up anything. Yep, there we go. It is completely empty. However, if you were to mount something, you would have a link here or well you would have a file here basically where you could go and access that device, browse its file system as long as you have the support for it. By support I mean that you support that your computer supports the format of uh, the format of the disk. So as I said, it could be NTFS for Windows or XFS or uh, EXT4, EXT3. It could be XFAT or whatever. XFAT is also one of the file. One of the it's pretty much like XT4. You use you would use XT, uh, FAT FAT32 or XFAT on your USB flash drives or something of a kind. Let's go ahead and clear this. And, oops, let's actually go back and do ls once more. Right next to the MNT, you have a file proc. Uh, you have a directory proc. And within the directory proc, you have the kernel system, you have the kernel that is being monitored and where the information is being written. So within this, again, virtual directory, uh, such information is written and here, Linux truly sticks to the dogma, everything is a file. So you got this one for IO, input output mem, interrupts for threads if I'm not mistaken, drivers, etc. All these files are accessible to you and you can monitor them. Sometimes they are used for troubleshooting, but I mean not sometimes, they are used for troubleshooting as well. If I do ls again, and we continue and we continue on now we have i'm going to go ahead and skip these uh, skip srv for now uh, there is a tmp that's where the temporary folders go and var is quite important to you var is extremely important to you that is where most of the web servers are are located that actually where most of the websites are located not web servers so let's say you made a web server you brought it up and if i go ahead and type in cd uh, var www press enter oh no such file oh, okay I didn't actually create anything of a kind here but it doesn't really matter uh, if I go into var, var alone and I do ls I have access to the log files from here that's one thing but also there would be a folder here called www where you would store your websites uh, any sort of websites could be stored there pretty much and anybody accessing them from outside would actually access them from this folder on the net by typing in the IP address Apache would know in which folder to look for uh, web, your website. Also if we go into var, basically this is variables, so if we go into log var variables, so if we go into Oh, come on, where am I? PWD. I am in VAR. I do not believe that I can access everything from my regular user, but it doesn't really matter. I just want to show you that the log files do exist and where they actually are. So for, cur for current events in the system, you can take a look at the messages and you see you have several dates. Some of them have been packed down below let's see what else do we got we got samba we got something some things that we can recognize uh, QMU uh, cups cron jobs etc I will go through some of these things in great detail with you but the most obvious thing that you will be able to understand what it actually is is vbox guest additions Dot log. Let's have. A, let's. Not sure if it's gonna allow me to take a look at it. We could check with the ll command to see who owns the file. 
But let's just see if we can actually do it. Eh, we can, excellent. So here you see you can read the log file for VirtualBox guest editions and obviously they have it failed in my case but my main objective was to only get a full screen and that is what I got. There are some other things that the guest editions can be used for or are used for but I don't really need that at this point of time. Now I'm going to leave this, go back a step, one more step back to ls again. Down below we have boot. Boot pretty much contains everything that the system needs to boot. All the files needed to boot the system. We can have a look here and there are a lot of things. This is where this is the place from where the Linux kernel is loaded up. Let's go back. And ls. Excellent. So Etsy is something where you will spend a good amount of your days in life if you become a network administrator, Linux network administrator. Etsy is a place where most programs hold their configuration files where you will go to change things, to reconfigure them, to configure them, to take, to take important information out and usually a large amount of your troubleshooting will involve uh, doing some sort of changes in the Etsy. Again, we have just libs, and then we have media. Media is for is a mounting point for mounting temporary file systems. By temporary file systems, I'm referring to US. Well, they're not temporary file systems. That would be a complete error on my behalf. They're just temporary devices that you would plug in and then plug out. No big deal. It's like plugging in a USB drive or a hard disk via USB or something of a kind. That's basically media. Opt, well, Opt is basically a place where people tend to, I mean, the system tends to install some sort of additional optional software, whichever way you want to put it. Root, root is a home directory of the root user. Now all the other users have their home directory within the main home directory and usually it is the same it has the same name as the use as their username. But for security reasons and for the sake of logic, sake of operational logic of Linux, root home folder has been placed outside of home. Right next to root we have sbin, those are the system binaries, and if I mentioned that these uh, that this one here is actually system binaries. Well, yeah, technically you do use them, but over here you really have those system binaries. Let me just show you for a sec. Uh, Sbin ls. So you see, you have I don't, on some systems, for example, Sbin and Bin differ by the fact that fdisk is not available or ifconfig to see the network configure to see if your see your ip address to see the network configuration is not available so certain things would be certain commands certain programs would be placed into into sbin and some other pl things would be placed into bin as i said one of the most typical examples are fdisk and ifconfig and on this on this particular system you can actually do ifconfig from the command line without any problems as pretty much any user unless forbidden to do so. There we go, we have IP tables for a firewall here, we have IV for playing around with your wireless adapter and so on and so forth. Most of these things would actually, well, I'm not sure if most, of the, I mean most of these things would require root permissions if not all of them. You have yum again etc. Uh, let's just leave this. Let's, so the way that this is actually referred to is system binaries and this is just binaries even though you can actually find, I did make a bit of an error at the beginning, these are not system binaries, the first one, these are just binaries and down below you have system binaries. There are differences, for example there are some commands could be, some programs could only be in system binaries uh, while not being in binaries. 
as I mentioned before, FDisk and IF config are the most common examples, although not in Red Hat. Right next to it, you have US, well, actually, not right next to it, let's just skip the sys as well. So we've just skipped two SRV and sys. We'll explain them shortly, but I wanted to explain the ones that are straight off there, the ones that you should really know. USR, contrary to common belief, this does not stand uh, for user or anything of a kind. It stands something like Unix system uh, resources. Yes, Unix system resources, if I am mistaken there, feel free to hang me or something of a kind, scream at me in the discussion section. I will be more than happy to help anyone out. So Unix, uh, the Unix system resources, there you can find all sorts of things. You can find, I mean, as, as the name says, it's a Unix system resources. Whatever is needed can be pulled from there as a resource. Whatever resources are needed can be pulled from USR. You have their local libraries, shared libraries, but let's go ahead and dive into the USR and see what what awaits us there. So you see, you have bin, you have you have bin, you have Etsy for configuration files, uh, you have lib and lib64, local, sbin, share, SOR, src, and tmp as well. So I don't know, USR is like a file system to itself, to me anyway. I mean, don't don't go onto a test saying this or something of a kind. That's just what it appears to be to me. Okay, so the last two remain the last two remaining are SRV, where service data is basically located, and down below we have sys, where where data is exported from the kernel, about all sorts of subsystems, har associated hardware and device drivers. Anyway. Over here, during the course of this tutorial, actually, you have managed to see what the what the Unix Unix or Linux-like file system is in general. How is it designed? How is it made? Uh, well, not how is it made, but what it what it was made to resemble. What sort of an idea is behind it? So you, it's a hierarchical state. You have the root folder in it, you have these sort of folders, and below them they just keep on branching, unlike the Windows systems where you have different partitions, and for example, the root would be C, and then you would go there into System32, and there you would have all those system files, unlike here where you have SBIN and BIN, and you have the library, so it doesn't matter how many disks you have on your computer, you would have literally hundreds of them, uh, or just one, and this file system would be the same as you see it before me now. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't be going. Oh, I don't know. Depending on what sort of information would you be browsing, you would be going from one disk to another. But for example, uh, you could have different home directories on different disks, and that is nothing strange. That would function no problems. In any case, I would like to bid you all farewell. Uh, I sincerely hope that I shall see you in my next tutorial. But above all, I wish to I I wish you a download of luck because you're gonna need it. And for anything else, just feel free to go up in the discussions and ask whatever you wish.